Okay, on the bench today we have a yellow bird. So this is a Robin T240D uh, base mobile radio. Yes, this <laughs> this is uh, back in the day would have been considered a base or mobile radio because it does have uh, the ability to run on uh, either 120 or 12 volts. Uh, customer sent this in. The note says uh, radio has always had little to no receive. Restore if you can. Radio is in pretty good shape, but it looks like it was hit on the back left corner. Uh, so yeah, basically, once it restored, if it can be. Uh, took the covers off of it, and that's pretty much, I haven't really looked at it. Uh, the first thing I noticed, <laughs> haven't looked really at the bottom yet, but the top. There is something glaringly, it's, yeah, just take a 2x4 a and crack yourself upside the head. It, it sticks out so, so obvious. What in the hell is up with that vacuum tube? Why does it look like it has been sitting <laughs> at the bottom of the ocean for the last 20 years? What in God's name is up with this thing? <laughs> Pins are corroded. I can even see some of the corrosion down in the, the tube socket there. But man, what in... Yeah, that poor little 6BA6 is... Yeah. It's even kind of sticky if you hold on to it for any length of time, so... Yeah, I... <laughs> as crunchy as those pins are, I'm just going to replace that tube <laughs> so it can go into the parts bin back there. <laughs> um, other than that, it's actually a really clean-looking radio. I mean, I have not cleaned anything yet. I haven't done anything to it other than remove the top and bottom covers. Yeah, there's, there's almost no dirt. I mean, for an old tube radio, that's rare, because tube radios are very prone to getting very dirty on the inside. They get, you know, tubes get really hot, so a lot of air circulates through the cabinets of these things. You've always got, you know, heat convection drawing cool air in, and the hot air goes up through the cover. So, yeah, it's, it's surprisingly clean. I mean, it may have been cleaned at some point in time, but, uh, uh, you know, it looks like most... All of the other tubes may all be original. Yeah, that one, all the writing's gone. Nope, nope. I think that's some Matsushita logo on there. Yeah, these may... So it may have been cleaned, because that's the only way the writing's going <laughs> to basically disappear off of a vacuum tube. But yeah, it looks like all the rest of the tubes... Other than this one's obviously been replaced. That's a tongue sole. So that's these were made in these radios were made in Japan, and from the factory would have had a full complement of Matsushita tubes, your Japanese manufactured tubes. Um, but yeah, top side looks good. So uh, one tube will get replaced. I don't honestly care if this thing tests good or not. <laughs> the corrosion on those pins. I'm not even going to try to clean them up. It, it just Man, what, what would make somebody think you'd just stick something in that even looks like that? <laughs> that's, that's, that's funny. <laughs> so, uh, one other thing is, notice there's uh, uh, extra channels in this. Now, for those that aren't familiar with these radios, these came in basically... Um, and it's not just this manufacturer. This chassis was used by a lot of different companies. Uh, this is a 40-channel radio, so it has an LED display. All the earlier radios were 23 channels. They did not have... There was two solid-state synthesizer boards in here, so this doesn't have, like, your normal normal radios, just a one-chip wonder PLL system. Um, it's com The circuit's a little bit more complicated, because this is a very early solid-state synthesizer circuit. But... Uh, just like uh, Sonar, uh, when they went from 23 channels to 40 channels, basically what they did was is they took their oscillator tube out. There's an empty hole in the chassis. They threw that in a trash can or you know, just didn't install it. And so basically removed the vacuum tube oscillator circuit and just installed a solid state synthesizer circuit and, you know, and a uh, channel selector switch um, where the old ones had a big bank of crystal, you know, big a rotary wafer switch with a boatload of crystals on the back of it and did crystal mixing. So yeah, this one does have a channel mod. That's what the toggle switch bodged in the back there is. I'll have to ask him if he wants that or if he wants it removed. 
but yeah otherwise man it's it's clean mm -hmm. and these are an absolute pain in the butt to work on <laughs> honestly the 23 channels are a lot easier to work on a whole hell of a lot easier to work on these two boards are a pain in the butt just because the way they're mounted down in here and if you're completely restoring your radio well you got to get both of those boards out to change the aluminum electrolytic capacitors that are on them <laughs> so yeah it's just a pain in the butt uh, so let's flip her over here let's see what the underside yeah you can see the crinkled he, that he said and it looks like somebody straightened it out with a pair of regular slip joint pliers I mean really <laughs> couldn't use smooth jaw parallel jaw pliers but uh, bottom looks pretty clean uh, another thing a little bit extra work you have to do to these when you're recapping them uh, the tube type radios do not have this board this is your low voltage board for the synthesizer boards up top um, I can see there is a brand new resistor there so we're going to assume that the original was probably nuked um, what else do we have here well, the time bomb cap didn't explode. One thing, <laughs> be it a 23 channel or a 40 channel radio, you know, any of these electrolytic capacitors or uh, filter caps. So there are polarized like this and non-polarized like this capacitors. Internally, they're basically about the same. Uh, two sheets of aluminum foil separated by a piece of paper impregnated with the dielectric. Um, just this one's non-polarized and this one is, but this one right here I see so many of these blow up it's a non-polarized cat and yet they just they're not known for holding up really well <laughs> just over the I mean granted you got to remember how old these radios are but these things are a nightmare because when they explode all of that paper and it's not just these any capacitor when they blow up it's a mess because it's paper and aluminum foil, well, what happens to that in an explosion? It turns into little teeny tiny fragments of aluminum foil everywhere in the underside of your radio. And there's high voltage in here, so you've got to get every one of those little fragments of aluminum foil out. It's just, yeah, pain in the butt. Um, there is a burn mark right there. And actually, it looks like that capacitor right there is probably yeah because there's a cutoff lead right there you can see actually there's a piece of the tubing still left on it that one you can see obviously has been just tacked on there barely <laughs> it's not installed properly yeah I wonder if the original capacitor was laying over here and it popped um, ceramic capacitors do explode from time to time usually you'll see those on like the the main power line uh, caps if they have caps across the uh, you know your 120 volts you'll see him blow up yeah that one I'll have to look that one up on the schematic and see exactly what it's got to be soldered in properly anyhow but yeah like I say we can see there was some little bit of fireworks going on there other than that it looks pretty good uh, can't say I see like I see there's one resistor in that cap looks like about the only things obviously that have been replaced maybe that resistor right there yeah that one's I think that one's yeah that one's been replaced too so it's not uncommon old radio for the carbon composition resistors or carbon film resistors you know, they get hot they burn up it's an old tube radio but yeah it looks like that one may have been replaced I say that because notice the body color most of your more modern style, you know, made within the last decade or two, but uh, film type resistors like this, the carbon films, have a tan body, where these older ones are a little bit darker brown. This is pretty much the only one in here that color. You look at all the other resistors in this radio, they're a darker brown. No matter where you look in here, that one's about the lightest, so it may have been replaced. I'll need to check all the resistors in this anyhow. Um, and when you're checking resistors, honestly, the, the ones you really need to worry about are going to be your high value resistance wise. So anything, best rule of thumb I can give is anything several hundred thousand ohms up into the millions of ohms, test it. Uh, just from eyeballing the resistors, if you see the, the third band, okay, so you have 
two the first two bands you should if you're going to be doing this obviously you should know how to read resistance colors but the first two bands are just digits the third band is your multiplier band if you ever see that band is yellow or green in an old tube radio test it the don't ask me why I'm not a resistor engineer I don't design them for a living but just from experience the higher value resistors seem to drift out of tolerance faster and more frequently than lower value resistors so if you ever see anything with a yellow or green band those are the ones you're definitely going to want to hit with an ohm meter and make sure they're still okay like I can see one right here it's got a green band so anything with a yellow or green band is going to be in the hundreds of thousands or millions of ohms so yeah otherwise this is a pretty clean looking little radio got a few few things that look like they've been done to it um, few things just a little questionable like I say that how it's installed what's that burn spot there um, I'll check the value on any parts that look like they've already been replaced to make sure they weren't a modification but I kind of doubt it because yeah that's the RF gain that resistor goes to the RF gain um, but yeah nice I think it's uh this old yellow bird should uh, work pretty good you know, actually, <laughs> I think the first thing we're going to do, I usually don't even turn on radios like this. Uh, I've had a lot of people ask me, how, well, how can you work on a radio if you never, if you don't even turn it on before you start working on it? Honestly, old tube radios like this, I don't like turning them on. <laughs> even on a current limited variable power supply, I still don't like to turn them on. Just because when I first turn it on it works doesn't mean 10 seconds, a minute, or two minutes later all of a sudden one of these capacitors in this thing isn't just going to go short out internally and go BOOM! Again, then I'm left with that mess to clean up. So, you know, if a customer wants, wants it restored, I just do the... I'll test all the tubes, I replace the high wattage resistors, I replace all of the electrolytic and paper filter style capacitors, then I'll turn it on. Not only that, uh, turning a radio like this on, finding that it has problems, because apparently it does, and I wouldn't be surprised if this tube, honestly, is his low receive problem. <laughs> I'll actually test this. As a matter of fact, we'll pause the camera after I get done talking here. We'll grab a tube tester and we'll just check this just to see if it is any good. But, uh, you know, going over a radio finding a bunch of problems in something like this it's just like even a solid state radio with bad electrolytic capacitors somebody sends me the radio they want it restored they want it repaired but they also want it restored they've told me beforehand they want all the electrolytic capacitors replaced so why should I waste my time and if I'm wasting my time working on a customer's radio that means I'm gonna be wasting the customers money you know what's the use in going through testing the radio, troubleshooting a bunch of faults that you know can very likely be a bad tube, a bad electrolytic capacitor, a bad filter capacitor, or in tube type radios, especially if they have all carbon film resistors, so radios even earlier than this, um, can have a, bad, a bunch of bad resistors. I could spend hours diagnosing all kinds of problems just to find out all of those problems would have just gone away if I had just replaced those parts first because they're going to get changed anyhow so that's why I do that work first so yeah actually let's test this thing out well um I, like I, said, I usually don't do that but just for for shits and grins we'll we'll give it a shot this time uh, first thing we'll do is we'll actually test this tube to see if it's actually any good um, I'm gonna stick a new one in here because um, that is in the receive receive path right here. That's one of the IF amplifier tubes right there. So yeah, definitely if this tube is bad, this will definitely affect the receive in this radio. Um, we'll bring it up slowly on a uh, Variac power supply and see you know see if we can duplicate the customer's concerns. See how uh, see if it transmits what it looks like, um, and then then I can get into actually doing the restoration. Okay, so I got the tube tester out here. Tube's been in. It has had time to warm up. Already have the controls set. Line voltage has been set. And the tube does test good, but remember I said the pins are corroded. Now this tube tester, I know all of the tube sockets in this are in excellent condition. They all have tight pins. Any, because this is one that I use regularly. 
um, and any of the pins, if any of the tube sockets had pins that were loose, either the entire tube socket was replaced with a, a replacement or I just replaced the pins because you can actually a lot of people don't realize that you can replace just the pins in most tube sockets you just desolder it twist it around uh, push the little lock tab in and you can actually push the pins out the top side and then just drop a replacement in and replace just that pin but uh, so if I push P4 on this tube tester that's actually what the world chart is telling me to press to test it and you can see the meter doesn't move at all but if I move the tube yeah, test good. It's, uh, actually, what are they calling for? Mutual conductance 2700. And we're reading about, what, 21 to 3, about 2300. So, yeah, it's the tube's testing good. Um, but, yeah, it's, the pins are so corroded. <laughs> you can see it's, ah, oh, it's kind of wobbling around there. So, you know, it could have been doing just that in the radio. Depending, you know, how it was pushed in, if the corrosion was in between the contacts and the pins on that tube, yeah, it may not have been working too good. So, yeah, I'd, man, I'd just like, I'd be interested to know what in God's name is this? It, it just, wow, I've never seen a tube that nasty before. Ever. <laughs> I've sorted through hundreds of thousands of tubes in my lifetime. I have never, ever seen one this nasty. It looks like somebody painted it with varnish, let it cook for a couple days, painted it with varnish again. I mean, just, it's sticky. Yeah, it's, ugh. <laughs> I don't know. It's getting replaced. I'm not putting, I'm not putting that, that thing back in this, into that radio. So, um, we're not going to take a chance over a, a tube that, you know, only costs like, what two fifty three dollars something like that a six b a six so let me go grab a uh, six b a six we'll drop a fresh mill spec one in here and uh, we'll fire it up and see if she works okay so it does look a little bit different than last time <laughs> I did turn it on uh, powered it up yeah receive was a, a little bit weak um, so the first thing I'll do, like I said, I haven't done any work to this thing yet. So I figured, well, first thing we'll do is we'll run through the uh, all the IF cans and just give them a quick tweak. And if you ever work on one of these, and I've had this happen, I don't have enough fingers and toes to count. It's just if you work on old tube type radios, expect to have problems with these transformers. <laughs> Especially uh, any of these Japanese made ones. Um... You'll stick your your alignment tool in here because the radio was turned on. You know, people were talking. I could hear them, but yeah, there was almost absolutely no st static in the background. So yeah, it, it's pretty deaf. Um, so anyhow, I'm running through the uh, the coils, and you're going to find these. They'll be tight. Uh, the problem is most all of these coils in this are double tuned. So there's actually it's a tu you know, tunable transformer, but there's actually two sections. There's a slug on the top and a slug on the bottom. It's got a solid tube runs through, has a ferrite core that comes in from the bottom and one through the top, and then there's a couple inductors at the top and a couple inductors at the bottom. But they're tuned to tune the circuits. The problem is when they, at the factory, after they do the alignment on these, they put paint in the holes. So the slugs couldn't turn. Well, they're tight to start with. I don't know what nitwit ever decided that, well, we better pour some paint in the hole to make sure that they definitely can't vibrate loose. I don't know if they thought we were launching these things into outer space or what, but yeah, it's the same white stuff like they have right here, like they use for Loctite. It's paint. The problem is trying to soften that stuff. Now, in even older radios, You'll commonly see that tube that the, the ferrite core is screwed into that runs from top to bottom. It's made out of like compressed cardboard or like a fibery type material. Those you can usually just put uh, like radio TV cement solvent, you know, which is the stuff that I use is mainly acetone. But you know, just take a straw. What I usually do, just save. I've, I've got dozens of these things I've saved off spray cans over the years. But you know, just put your finger, you know, put it down into the bottle, put your finger over the end. That holds a little bit in the straw. And then just stick it down in there. Take your finger off the end and it'll run out. But soften that glue up. Yeah, the problem with these is the tubes are plastic. So if you go putting any, the only solvents I have ever found that will melt that stuff 
Well, unfortunately, they also melt the plastic tubes that they use in these. So, but what happens is you'll turn and it's exactly what happened to the transformer that used to be here because it's no longer in the radio. I had to take it out because as I was trying to, to turn it, I had it loose a little bit. I was jiggling. I probably spent five minutes on that thing. <laughs> Um, I got this one broke loose, the top and the bottom, got to this one, got it broke loose a little bit, jiggling, and then, whoop, and the sound went away, just went completely deaf, and I knew exactly what had happened, the tube turned, because there's not much that holds the tube in, so, here's what we have, this is what's inside of the metal can, and then, another thing, these things are a pain in the butt to get out, you've got to this flipped over so you can see the underside now luckily this one wasn't too bad to get to it's fairly in the open and that can vary from not just this style radio but from you know, radio manufacturer different styles of radios sometimes just getting to the connections on the underside can be a royal nightmare because there can be big components covering stuff up be a lot of stuff around it just in encroaching in around the pins so you know I had to desolder all of the pins pull all the components off of it then you have to take the two nuts off because just like this transformer over here you can see there's the studs that stick up or down through the chassis and then there's a nut goes on and again they have paint on them <laughs> well these cans yeah they're not the, the most durable things and you can put some radio TV cement solvent on there to soften the glue up the problem is some of that stuff leaches down into the threads and you really got to work it back and forth these cans are very flimsy and that's what happens right there you'll rip the side of the can out <laughs> so double whammy now we've got a core with wires ripped off of it and we've destroyed the can ah! <laughs> it's just ain't our day is it <laughs> and this is only the second transformer but yeah so that busted out now, i'm not even going to try to fix this there's no use in me trying to fix this when i can just because I have parts chassis for pretty much everything um, that I've already dismantled over the years. So I have parts chassis that are already, you know, the chassis themselves are gone, but I've kept all the parts. So yeah, I've got spare ones. So this, and this has a T number on it, where this is a, a 240, where this is an L4, your L401s for the T240s. The earlier version, the 23 channel, they had T's on there. But yeah, this is a T123. Uh, B, but yeah, I'll just use this can. And actually, I think this is probably the same 455 IF can. I could probably just use this transformer, but I'm not because the other one's repairable. I'll just take a look at it real quick. Yeah, what do we got for caps? 301, 301, and they're both 301. And, yeah, I'd have to check them on... Uh, yeah, it looks like this one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four layers of windings. I'd have to check it with an inductance meter, but it looks like they're probably the same. Uh, but, yeah, so here's what actually happens. These plastic tubes, like I was saying, they go into the base right here. Well, they just put a little dot of glue down here. So there's not much holding this tube into the base. And you can see the white stuff. Because luckily the tube's clear, so it's not, we don't have to look down through the middle. You can actually just see through the tube. But you can see all that white stuff right there. And you can see all the white stuff right there. That's paint. Yeah, it's the same paint that they pour around all the nuts and bolts on this thing. So that's why this happens. Those cores are tight in these tubes to start with. Like I said, I don't know whatever made them think that they need to put a, a Loctite style <laughs> stuff into these things to keep them from coming loose. But yeah, that's what's going to happen. You'll try to loosen these up as careful as you can and just be prepared. This is going to happen to you eventually if you work on these things. The tube's going to turn. You've got these tiny little wires here. And let's see, on this one, it was actually both of the wires on this side. There's no wires attached to either of these terminals anymore. Uh, look around the camera here. There's one of them right there. And where's the other one? The other one is right here. So there's the other end. So I'll be able to get them. They're still plenty long enough. I just turned the core back a little bit. 
I'll be able to get them soldered back onto these two terminals. So the transformer is perfectly fine. It can be saved. But yeah, I'm just it'd be easier just to replace and try instead of trying to repair this to get to get the, the the mounting stud put back on where it's ripped out. Like I say, these things are just you can see how flimsy they're aluminum. And you can see even this one's kind of tweaked. The can's kind of twisted because yeah, they just they don't take much stress. So yeah, I'll just I'll just use this can. This would be nice replacement for it. <laughs> and get this put back together and then I can turn it back on again and see if I can get receive uh, sensitivity up any. Uh, a lot of times on radios like this, um, now granted I have not changed, like I say this is uncommon for me to be doing it in this order, uh, turning it on I usually don't. I just wanted to do that you know, to see what it's like for you guys on camera, guys and gals, but uh, you know I'd normally replace all the caps and the high wattage resistors first and then but I still would have run into this problem. Even if I did that work first, I still have to do a transceiver alignment on it, so I'm still going to have to adjust both of those those cores in there at some point. So this would have happened, doesn't matter at what point, it was going to going to happen. So yeah, it's, it's inevitable. So hopefully none of these other ones do the same thing. It's just, eh, poor design. <laughs> well, it's not even design. Actually, there's nothing wrong with these if they just hadn't glued the damn ferrite cores in. Uh, so yeah, I still got one, two, three, four more, and yes, I am definitely going to make sure I get these cores loose, <laughs> easy to you know, unscrew in and out of this before I put this thing back together. So yeah, I mean, I'm looking at this can here. Now I have not taken any of these other ones out, haven't done anything to them. Just look at how warped the side of that can is that's just from where apparently where they tightened it up at the factory you can see how how it buckled the can and that's the problem you try to loosen these things up even if there wasn't any adhesive you know paint on the threads here when you go to first loosen that nut up that whole studs turn it's just locked on there and yeah you can just rip the side of these cans out cuz like i say the, the cans are so flimsy so be careful but hey <laughs> It's 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 going to happen. I mean, you're going to run into that, and you're going to run into the broken wires on these eventually. So you, um, like I said, easy to repair. Now, if the if the wire had broken off, and usually if these wires do break off, try and get the background out of the way so this camera can see what we're doing here. So usually, if the wires break, they will usually break right at the terminals where they're attached. But if it does break up here somewhere else. Quite honestly, if you look at how many wraps of wire are on this coil, if you take, so if you run out, there's just not enough to get back to the terminal. If you take one wrap off of that, are you going to lose a little bit? Yes. Is it really going to matter? Quite honestly, no. You have to realize there's two coils here to start with. That is a lot of wraps around, so yeah, that transformer, there is a lot of wraps of wire right there unwrapping one more wrap so you can gain a little bit of length to get back down to this terminal isn't going to affect it horribly is it going to change the inductance yes a little bit but you have to remember it is tunable so you'll be able to you'll still be able to tune this thing to get it get it into alignment but yeah it's worst case scenario if you know you're not like me and you have spares um, you know and your wire breaks off up up here higher or right let's say right here where this little dot of glue is yeah worst case scenario you could always just unwrap one wrap off of here because you, like I say you can see there's just a pile of wrap on top of wrap there so you know one less turn it's not really going to affect it that much now if there was only five wraps like five or six wraps on on <coughs> excuse me if there was only like five or six wraps around there, yeah, taking one wrap off would make a huge difference. But with that many wraps, yeah, there's nothing to worry about. So let me get that uh, fixed up, reinstalled, and I can try to loosen up the rest of these. And, you know, we'll cross all the fingers and toes that I can here and <laughs> hope none of the other ones break, these tubes break loose. Because, unfortunately, the only thing that holds these in these tubes into this base is a little bit of glue down there at the base and of course it's an antique the glue's dried out and yeah the tubes get loose and then you try to adjust it and the whole two you can see I can just pull this one up and out yeah they just come out so just no matter how careful you are it's gonna happen 
Okay, so I thought I'd actually show a little bit about fixing this. So these windings that are on here, the actual wire, you don't need to worry about trying to strip the insulation off of it because this is insulated wire. Uh, just turn the tip temperature up on your soldering iron a little bit, or if you have one that's not temperature controlled, it's probably already hot enough. Uh, just hit it with your soldering iron a little bit, a little bit of a flux core solder. The insulation will melt back. So you can see I've already pre-tinned that one sticking out, and you can see the one on the other side there sticking out. It's already pre-tinned, and then. To actually mount this tube back down into the base, of course, I don't want to have to wait a week for the glue to dry, so I like using something that's going to dry relatively fast. Fingernail polish works really good uh, for you know makes a great Loctite uh, that can be removed later because all you need is a little bit of acetone. But it's also good for doing stuff like this, reseating these tubes back down into the bases. Once I get the wires soldered back on. I'll just clamp this in a small vise and lightly warm this with a hot air gun. Yeah, I'll just use a hot air uh, reflow gun, but I mean, you can just use a normal shoot a hair dryer for that matter. That'll speed up the process a little bit. But the, like I say, the advantage is this stuff dries really fast, and it's hard. You know, once it dries, it's fairly hard, and it, it'll do actually better than the glue that they used. Because the glue that's down in there, it's actually kind of rubbery. It reminds me of the... Uh, uh, the corrosive conductive glue that you'll see on more modern radios, you know, solid state radios. Yeah, a little bit of fingernail polish. So you know, pull the tube out the whole way. Just take your brush, paint a little bit on there, shove the tube back down in there, heat it up. That'll speed up the heating process. You know, basically it'll cure in about you know, in less than a minute. Then, and it'll be ready to put back in. Okay, got the transformer soldered back in. And was just giving it another little quick glance over, and yeah, I happen to notice this thing uh, has another modification, which definitely has to go. That yellow wire, <laughs> that's not supposed to be there. You can see that's directly shorting out this electrolytic capacitor and this resistor right here. That's a, a high power mod, so bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, I just thought I'd show that before I take it out. Uh, you'll see that, and if you ever open up one of your radios, uh, anything like this can be a Lafayette, realistic, doesn't really matter whose name's on the front of it, can be a Colt, you know, like one of the Colt Midnights. Um, any of these tube type radios like this, the Panasonic chassis, uh, most of them will have this circuit that looks very similar to this. If you see a wire jumper across a resistor and electrolytic capacitor, take it out of your radio. Your radio will thank you. Okay, so radio's plugged in. Um, one thing of note on these, uh, like I say, the main chassis in these were used by a lot of different manufacturers. It's basically just a different faceplate on the radio. Now, there were some differences. Some had more features than other ones. These radios, the Robins, one thing they were known for was that other radios didn't have was a tone control. So they have a pull switch here. When you pull it out, it adds a tone so it knocks off the highs, which is good for getting rid of static, because that's usually where most of your static is. Uh, you know, it kind of has a full complement of controls, at least as far as tube-type radios go for, you know, AM only. It does have a delta tune or your clarifier, and it does have a center detent. Um, they really didn't need that in these radios because it's PLL synthesized. Honestly, any AM radio up until even today, you, know, you buy a brand new modern radio. If it's AM only, you don't need a Delta Tune, really, or a clarifier. It's AM. The only time you really need a clarifier is sideband. Now, the exception was, in old tube-type radios that were crystal synthesized, you definitely needed a clarifier or a Delta Tune control. That's because it mixed two different crystal frequencies, unless it was a really old one where it had separate receive and transmit crystals, but those would still be the same thing. Everything was done with crystals. It didn't have a reference oscillator with a PLL circuit. So every time you change channels to a different channel, you were using different crystals. And there's no calibrations for the frequencies that those crystals oscillate at. So, yeah, you were kind of at the, at the mercy of whatever that crystal oscillated at, that's what the frequency was. So the Delta Tune control was definitely needed back then. You really don't need it with a radio like this because it's, it's solid-state synthesized. That's going to be fairly stable, even though it is inside of a tube-type radio that gets really hot. It's still going to be very stable. They really didn't need it, but like I say, it's still there. Um, had, you know, it also has RF gain control. 
um, has the range extender, um, and then has a full complement of lights, transmit, receive, external speaker, modulation, and PA lights has external switch. So you can turn on an external speaker and it disables this one. Um, it also has the PA CV button there. Um, now, one difference between this radio and some of the other companies that made this was this one only has one control for turning the radio on and off. As this radio sets right now, the control is turned off. It's fully counterclockwise and click into the off position. But it's not off. If you look in at that vacuum tube right there, you can probably just see the filaments glowing. And if you look back at the final tube, you'll see that filament's glowing. Well, the filament's actually glowing in every single tube in this, and that's because this radio has... Uh, it's, it's the middle of the morning, it's like 2.30 here, so <laughs> don't have my window blind open. Yeah, you can see instant on. Get a flashlight there. <laughs> um, most other radios that had that instant on feature actually had two on-off switches. They didn't call it instant on, they had one switch that was labeled standby, and then the other control would have one that was labeled on-off. What you would do in those radios was, and it was kind of like if you got home from work. You knew you were going to be talking on the radio. You were going to go eat dinner and then go do your rag chewing on the radio that night. You'd, what you'd do is you'd come home, you turn the standby on, and it did just what this radio's in right now. It put it in standby. The high voltage is turned off. The filaments are still receiving voltage, though, so the tubes get hot. Now, actually, I'd have to pull the schematic. I think this does run at a reduced volt. Most of them did. They ran the, the filament voltage at a reduced voltage when you had it in the instant on or standby mode. But in those radios with two controls, you could turn that on and off. So when you had both controls turned off, the radio was just that, off, completely 100% off. This radio is not like that. When you, this only has a single control. So on the other ones, you turn a standby on, that applied voltage to the filaments. Then when you actually wanted to use the radio, you'd turn the on-off control on, and basically the instant you turn it on, the radio was on like that. You didn't have to wait for the tubes to warm up. They were already warmed up. This one only has the one control. As long as this thing's plugged into a wall, those filaments are going to be glowing. And, you know, theoretically, a tube should never go bad in the perfect world with the perfect vacuum tube that has zero impurities in it that's manufactured perfectly but there is nothing there is no such thing as the perfect tube so anytime you turn on something tube type you're you're shortening the life of the tubes now granted a lot of people do have the misconception especially uh, younger people no no offense you weren't around in the tube type days but a lot of people I think are kind of misled to think that vacuum tubes have a very, very short life, no, they don't. They last a really, really long time. You'd be surprised how long vacuum tubes can last. This is a good example. It has all original tubes except for that one back there. Um, and the only reason I changed it is is because the pins are just so oxidized it's ridiculous, and I'm not going to spend three hours trying to get whatever that cooked-on goop on it off. But, uh, yeah, just be aware of that with this radio right here. Even when it's off, the filaments are still on. So you've got all these little furnaces on in here, you know. These tubes are still... Now, they're not at full they're full heat, I guess you could say, because, like I say, they're running at a reduced voltage. But, yeah, pretty much the instant I turn this on, um, you're going to hear sound come out of the speaker because it's just that last little bit of voltage. They'll heat up really quick to that last little bit. So there'll be a fraction of a second. There may not be sound, but it'll really quickly come in. Yeah, you could see it was, and then it kicked in. Huh, there's actually somebody even this early in the morning. I just heard somebody. But that is what I did not have before. No static. You put it on any channel, you turn the volume control the whole way up. It was quiet until somebody started to talk. Then you would start to hear, you'd actually start to hear something coming out of the speaker. Um, it could have been that tube, like I say, as oxidized as the pins are on that thing. I can't believe somebody put that in this radio. It could have just been a bad connection there. It also very likely could have been these transformers were out of alignment. Uh, that's very common. Anything tube type, if it hasn't been touched for 30, 40, or 50 years, well, it hasn't been touched for 30, or 40, or 50 years. 
all the components in this thing have changed changed value over the years. So uh, I got this transformer put back in, uh, you know, repaired that one and put it in a replacement can. Here's the original one. And like I said, that's just because it's trying to fix that. Forget it. These flimsy cans. Just easier since I have already. I just put it in a, in a good can. Um, I was luckily, you know, thank God, <laughs> lucky. Luckily, all of the other transformers, I was able to get those uh, ferrite cores broken loose easily without actually damaging anything, so I didn't have to take any other ones apart. Um, and then just did a quick by ear alignment, because, of course, I have not changed any capacitors, any of the resistors, anything in this radio yet, so I'm not going to go doing a, a calibrated alignment on this thing, because I'm just going to have to do it again once I change all the parts. But yeah, I just did a quick by ear alignment on the IF, you know, basically the receiver circuitry, and yeah, it's, it's receiving just fine. Like I say, there's really, really nothing on right now. It's so early. Ah, there's somebody. There's one loud talker still <laughs> on Channel 6 this early in the morning. But, uh, yep, so now that it does work, um, like I say, this is kind of out of sequence for me. Normally, I'd just recap and re-resistor it before I even turned it on. But I thought we'd, I'd just show it uh, just to, to show you that it does work. So we'll get this done, uh, get it aligned, and... Uh, see how well she works once I'm done. Um, one thing I did, I don't know if I mentioned it, I think I, I think I might have, I removed this little yellow wire, uh, that was a high power modification, it's something I wanted to remove before I forgot it. Uh, somebody had shorted out an electrolytic capacitor and resistor on the bottom side, which just shortens the life of the final tube, it just o overdrives the radio, so yeah, that modification was removed. So, let me get to it, Now, next time you see this, uh, it should be done unless I run into anything I'm not really thinking I'm going to because other than this little yellow wire the switch and the two you know a couple parts it looks like somebody replaced at some point in time on the bottom it doesn't really look like it had anything else done to it so yeah just a nice old 1977 vintage radio it's just time for its uh you know, hundred thousand mile tune-up. <laughs> we'll get her, get her back and ready to work for the next couple decades. Yeah, I'm really, really just going to have to go over this radio with a fine-tooth comb. <laughs> I'm just getting ready to start replacing the electrolytic capacitors. And the first one I usually do is the main uh, can filter capacitor. What's the first thing I see? Another yellow wire I didn't see before. What is that yellow wire? Yeah, it's jumpered across this resistor. Another no-no. <laughs> why, why must people try to destroy their radios? I mean, really? <sighs> oh, yeah, more voltage must be better. We don't need all them resistors. We'll just jump. I mean, why didn't they just jumper all the resistors in this radio? What do we need any resistors for? God. Yes. If you ever see shit like that, just remove it. It should not be in there. Okay, so I've got most of the... Uh work done to it. Uh, electrolytic capacitors replaced um, pretty much on the main chassis. Uh, I'm getting ready to move on to the PLL uh, synthesizer circuit here and I thought before I put my parts box away <laughs> that I had to pull out to get uh, this transformer can, I'd show what is the big difference between this and the original 23 channel version radio. So this radio, like I said, is solid state synthesized. So it has these two circuit boards here, which are an absolute nightmare to work on. <laughs> now, there are two screws that attach this board to a little 90-degree mounting bracket, and then there's another one that attached this, this board to a mounting bracket. Uh, I've got the screws out of this one. They're right here. And, yeah, that's all you can move this board. You still have to desolder a bunch of wires that interconnect. It was kind of like a... I don't know, Panasonic's for, because you got to remember, it, this wasn't made by uh, Robin. It's a Panasonic chassis. But yeah, it was kind of an afterthought <laughs> when it came to connecting these two together because some of the wires have push-on terminals. Some of them don't. This coax cable has is soldered on one side, push-on terminals on the other side. There's another coax cable on here that's soldered on both sides. Ah, uh, what were they thinking? <laughs> but yeah, it's you have to disconnect all these wires. It's like I said, that's it. That's all the movement you have out of this thing with those two screws out. 
So you got to take all those wires off so you can get the board up and out to be able to change all the electrolytic capacitors. But this is the difference right here. This is the channel selector out of 823 channel Robin. So that is what replaced this. Now this is, for those that don't know, uh, the older radios, or actually I should say middle of the road radios. This is a, you know, more modern. I mean, a lot more complicated because it's done with a lot of individual components, but this is basically the same thing that's in your radios today. Uh, just done with, like I say, a lot of separate parts, but it's a PLL or phase locked loop synthesizer circuit. The radios before that used something like this. They used a channel selector switch that had two different sets of crystals in it that operate in two different frequency ranges. Uh, and that, that varies from different, different type of radio to radio. These use 23 megahertz and 14 megahertz crystals. You know, if I pull out a few of these, like there's a 23 megahertz crystal, 23.540. And let me look down in here and try and find a, yeah, there's another black one's a 14. So that one's a 14 point, what is that, 9? Yeah, 14.960 megahertz. But when you change the channel selector, what you're doing is selecting, they'll usually have, you'll pick one crystal. So when you, in, it'll usually be in like banks of four or five channels. So you know, you'll be on, let's say, channel one, it'll pick this crystal. And for channel one, two, three, four, and maybe I'd have to look at the crystal mixing scheme for this, but it'd be like four or five channels. As you turn the channel selector, that crystal will stay in circuit. But every time you change from one to two, three, four, five, it'll pick a different that other crystal, like the 14 megahertz crystal. Then when you get to channel 6, it'll change to this crystal, let's say. And then you'll go back through those other crystals again. You'll go 1, 2, 3, 4, or 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But that's, and they mix those two frequencies together to come up with the frequencies that are needed to make the radio operate on CB. But yeah, this simple contraption here is what was <laughs> that complicated nightmare right there replaced. I like to say before I put this box away, I thought I'd show because I was just getting ready to stick that ticket because I don't need a box out anymore. I was getting ready to put it back on a shelf and I thought I'd show that. But yeah, well, it's I mean solid state's more stable. You know, you can get extra channels easily without having to you know get custom cut crystals. But yeah, oh man, the nightmares of working on these things <laughs> they definitely weren't meant to be serviced. Okay, so I've got her powered up now, so all the work's been done to it. The uh, only thing I have left to do is the alignment and clean clean the radio. I've cleaned the inside. I just need to clean the outside when I and then get her put back together. Uh, one thing I thought I'd show really quick, I'd mentioned about the instant on. It had been so long since I worked on one of these, I couldn't remember off the top of my head uh, how the that instant on circuit was wired. What they're doing is... Uh, when the radio is in the on position, its AC is feeding the filaments, which is common for actually for most radios. There's no need to rectify the, the voltage supply going to the filaments. They'll heat up with DC or AC. It's just a resistive element. But what they're doing to cut the voltage down when the radio is in basically... What they call off, honestly, it's not off to me because the two, the filaments are still lit. But when you put it in the instant on or off position, what they're doing is is adding a single diode in series with the supply for the tubes. So basically what they're doing is they're adding a half-wave rectifier. So it turns it from AC into, in the case of this one, the negative. It's a negative DC supply. So actually if we look down here at the schematic... Uh, in the SAMS manual, we can see here, all, uh, get in camera view here, here are all of our filaments. And you can see there's actually two sections to the power supply switch. It actually has two sets of contacts. This is the high voltage section. So when this switch is turned off, that disables the high voltage going throughout the radio. This switch controls the low voltage circuit, which is what supplies voltage to the heater filaments. But you can see when the switch is turned off, this diode basically jumpers across it. And if we follow up, we can see that line, the feed line for that goes to pin 8. If you look over at the power cord, and that's another thing when you're working on these radios that have octal or uh, any of the different style plugs that were used on these, like the Sense Jones plugs, 
they'll have different jumper wires inside these plugs actually on the end of your power cord because depending on how that's wired you can then run the radio off of in this case AC or DC but anyhow if we come up we follow that line up to pin 8 you look at pin 8 that comes over there's a jumper wire inside the plug goes to pin 4 come back over to the radio look at pin 4 and that goes up to the winding here on the transformer so that's on all the time this transformer there's no connection or there's no on off switch to basically turn the power off to this transformer it always has power going to it so anytime you turn this switch on that supplies the 11 whatever that is 11.9 volts directly to the filaments and actually you can see it right there 11.9 VAC but when you turn the radio off it's not going to be 11 point turn that down a little bit <laughs> uh, it's not going to be supplying 11.9 volts AC because it has to go through this diode now that's basically the you know there's a, a short circuit you could say you turn the switch off but there's still a path for the power to get to the vacuum tubes but it's a diode so it's basically removing half of the AC voltage it's removing and you could put this honest well you actually you wouldn't want to put it in either direction but the way they have it wired you could if you stuck it in in either direction you would either be supplying the positive peaks of your AC voltage or the negative to the to voltage to the tubes but they're effectively cutting the power supplying voltage to these tubes in half because it's only getting half of the sine wave but uh, that's how that's done so, turn the volume back up. And it's another thing, reason I really like tube radios, it's one thing I, I don't want to say I despise, but I don't like about solid state radios that I absolutely love about pretty much all tube type radios is the squelch. If you think about the, the squelch on any solid state radio, President Lincoln over there, you know, it can be a Cobra, name, name the brand, it doesn't matter. When you turn the squelch up, it's either it only has one of two states, on or off. You turn the squelch up, and it just it, eventually your speaker just goes quiet. There's a break point, and it's but it's solid state. It's either on or off. Tube type radios have the advantage of ah, it kind of slides in or, and slides or it fades in and fades out. And different radios fade in and out at different levels. This one is a is almost like solid state you can hear it cutting in and out a little bit where some of the even earlier tube type radios they really faded in and out but the nice thing about that is if you turn your volume up and you carefully adjust the squelch instead of having either nothing or no squelch at all you know so sound or no sound you can actually find you can hear how the volume goes down when you start to find that like I say there's kind of a, a gray area there with these and it's one reason I don't like squelch now honestly the new president radios with their ASC they're pretty good at picking out a signal they know when there's a carrier there and it will unsquelch but anything other than the the more modern president radios this is probably the best thing there is because you can you can get to that point where there's almost nothing coming out of the speaker so it's not annoying I can I can I don't know if you can even hear that It's very low, but that way I don't miss a distant contact. I can set the squelch to where it's greatly reduced the volume coming out of the speaker, but I can still hear it. So if there's a really distant contact that on a solid state radio wouldn't break squelch, I can hear that on a tube type radio. Because of that gray area, there's, there is no definite on and definite off for the squelch. It just kind of slowly fades away. You know, the volume coming out of the speaker just slowly fades away. So, yeah. Like I said, I really like them not having a solid break point. <laughs> so, let me get the alignment done on this thing. I'll actually put the top cover back on this and let it warm up for about 15 minutes. I've had the radio on for about 20 minutes uh, while I clean, cleaned up a little bit. But I'll put the top cover on it, let it heat up for about 15 minutes so all the crystals the temperature of all the crystals stabilize and uh, then I can do the alignment on this and uh, get her cleaned up and I'll show you what it looks like once it's all put back together okay so went to do the alignment on this um, and I didn't get very far <laughs> um, I hooked it up to a signal generator uh, the frequencies are fairly close and 
this is a problem you're going to run into uh, with old tube type radios that are AM only. Uh, there's no frequency calibration points. Well, there's test points that you're supposed to check the frequency, but there's no adjustments. Uh, the only pretty much tube type radios where you're going to see frequency adjustments, uh, there'll usually be an adjustment for transmit frequency, but there is no adjustment for receive frequency. Uh, most of the crystals do not have a trimmer capacitor, so there's no adjustments. They just are what they are. <laughs> That's why we need the delta, delta tune. The problem is this thing is way off. I have to have the, the delta tune, and I noticed that actually I turned the radio on and uh, the skip is starting to come in, and someone was on channel 6, and they just didn't sound good at all. Turned the clarifier to almost full lock. Hey, they sound great. Go back to the, the center detent, and yeah, they sound like crap again. So I checked all the frequencies. Like I said, I was getting ready to do the alignment. Check the frequencies. They were all actually pretty close. They're close enough um, to where it should sound good on receive. You know, the, the delta tune should be, you know, somewhere right around the center detent. It shouldn't be slanted way off to one side. So uh, one thing these do have is they do have a ceramic filter. So I wanted to see if that's possibly because they do go bad <laughs> and it's a tube radio so it gets you know goes through very drastic temperature swings um, but these do have a 455 kilohertz crystal filter or not crystal a ceramic filter so I wanted to just check that uh, and an easy way to test that in radio is just feed a huge signal in through your signal generator as you can see that's that crystal filter is in series with our receive path so the signal comes through, goes through the first mixer, uh, gets down converted to a 10695 signal, uh, then goes through the second mixer and gets down mixed to a 455 kilohertz signal. And then it goes through this filter to shape it, so you know, basically to cut out all your adjacent channel splatter, um, you know, but it narrows the, audio, the, the bandwidth down um, and then goes through and gets amplified. I wanted to see has the, the center frequency of this crystal filter has it shifted in one direction or the other off of you know where it should be which is right at dead nuts centered on 455 kilohertz. Easy way to do that in something like this is just feed a huge signal you know, put the radio on whatever channel you want I have it on channel 20 and then feed a huge signal into the antenna right now I'm putting in a minus 27 dBm so yeah that's like a needle bending signal <laughs> but feed a really strong signal through that signal will come through it will get down converted to 10695 and then down converted to uh, 455 kilohertz and then just take a spectrum analyzer and test at the output of the crystal filter turn the, turn the delta tune and see what actually happens so now, luckily, that's not high voltage, so I can probe that dry. I mean, I am. I still have a DC uh, block on on there. And anytime you're doing any type of probing <laughs> with a with a spectrum analyzer, other than the way you would normally use it, uh, I use I like them as diagnostic tools. A lot of people just use a spectrum analyzer to look in. You know, they're basically sampling the RF output. They'll have a sampled output off of their uh, like, like when they're doing transmit. Um, Spectrum analyzers are actually very handy for doing receive problems of all kinds because you can not only can you look at signals being transmitted out of your radio, you can look at signals like in the case of this radio. We could look at the 10.695 frequency once it's been down converted from the second or from the first mixer. We can look at the second mixer where it gets down converted from 10.695 to a 455 kilohertz signal. Or in this case, we want to see what happens to that signal once it goes through the ceramic filter. And we want to see, is it attenuating a lot? So I just have the uh, ground clip to the chassis. Um, there's nothing else in line other than this scope probe, like I say, other than a DC block, which anytime, especially if you're dealing with something like this tube type where there's high voltage. Now, luckily, there is no high voltage on the ceramic filter. You can see it's completely isolated. It's transformer coupled from this side and transformer coupled from this side. So there's, you know, it goes the filter, the coil to ground, from the filter through the coil to ground, and then it's grounded. So there is no high voltage here. It's just your AC signal coming through. The high voltage is on the, you know, could potentially be on the other sides of those transformers. But like I said, we don't have to worry about that 
because it is it is isolated. So I can directly, and it's always also a good idea before you go sticking your scope probe that you have attached. Because remember, if you burn out the front end in your spectrum analyzer, it costs a lot of money. <laughs> That's the most expensive thing you can do to a spectrum analyzer is blow the front end out of it. So I always recommend anytime before you go sticking a probe onto something, take a voltmeter and just measure the voltage. See what the voltage is. If it's a high voltage, don't go hooking your hooking your probe up unless you're properly isolated. For starters, with a DC block, um, if the voltage is too high, you know you're going to need to make sure you have the signal attenuated down far enough. Um, I've already checked, like I said, looked at the schematic, saw that it was isolated. I still checked with a voltmeter because it only takes a couple seconds to go in there and check it. And that couple seconds could save because there's no saying that there might be a problem with one of those transformers. What if one of those is partially shorted and maybe leaching DC voltage through that? You know, you never know. So always try to protect your test equipment. Always measure <laughs> the voltage. So now the filter in this thing... And remember, anytime you're working on a radio like this, you need to be really careful when it's turned because it's on. So there's high voltage all throughout this thing. One slip with this probe, bzz, there goes your spectrum analyzer. One slip with your finger, bzz, you're dead. So very lethal voltages in a radio like this. Another thing to be careful with radios, anything that has vacuum tubes in it, you're pretty much guaranteed that the transmit receive switching circuit is being done with a relay. That relay, and actually let's just show that really quick. So there's a voltmeter over there. I've got the negative clamp to the chassis on this. And we're just going to take our voltmeter probe and probe the transmit switching pin here, which is pin 2. Try and get my hand so I don't slip off. 191 volts. So yeah, there's 100. And a lot of people think, oh my god, there's not supposed to be voltage there. Yes, there is supposed to be voltage there. Because what you're doing when you key your microphone, you're grounding that pin, which in turn grounds the relay. There's high voltage being supplied to one side of the relay coil. When you key the mic, that grounds the other side of the relay coil. The relay actuates and it switches into transmit. So yeah, be careful you don't accidentally go touching the microphone jacks. You know, if you're moving a radio around, it's turned on and you have the mic disconnected. If you get your finger in there, because those pins are only like that far from the edge of this connector, you could easily touch that with your finger and yeah, you'll be in for a shock. <laughs> so careful, careful, careful. High voltage, not only on the inside, there's high voltage present on the outside if you have the mic unhooked. So let me get a flashlight here. And where's my little pointer? We don't go probing around in here with our fingers. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not going to go flipping this thing over because it's just the way I like to work on them standing up like this. But right there is the, you can see the little black box. Okay, that's the ceramic filter. So it comes in one side. There's a pin that goes to ground and the other side comes out and goes to this transformer right here. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to put the camera on the spectrum analyzer and I'm going to probe carefully at that coil. Okay, and I'm going to turn the clarifier and you can see how the signal gets bigger. <laughs> the farther I get away from, from the frequency, because I have the spectrum, you can see the center frequency is set to 455 kilohertz. Ideally, the biggest peak we should see should be at 455 kilohertz. And what, what we're doing by turning the clarifier is, is we're changing the frequency, because that's adjusting, there's a pair of Varactor diodes in this, so we're adjusting the receive frequency, but you can see when we get, right there's center frequency. There's 455 kilohertz. Well, that's lower <laughs> than it is over here. Yeah, so apparently the... Uh, crystal filter is I mean it's working it's just its frequency has shifted over time so I'll need to replace that little guy so you know, I just go ahead and turn this radio off as a matter of fact and I need to replace that so because like I say the, fre the frequencies there are no adjustments um, let's go ahead I can show you the crystals on the synthesizer board here So you can see there's two crystals here. There's our 10.240, and this one is 
uh, what the heck is it, 15.25 megahertz, I think. But you can see there's two crystals. There's no adjustments. The only adjustment between these two circuit boards is that one right there, and that's used to set your VCO voltage. So there are no adjustments for either of the frequencies that those crystals are oscillating at. So like I said, as long as they're within tolerance, whatever your service manual calls for, they'll usually tell you, you know, as long as the frequency is within this many either parts per million or within this this frequency tolerance, they'll give you a percentage or so many hundreds of hertz in either direction. Um, it's fine, and these are within that frequency tolerance. So, yeah, like I said, once I checked that, I thought, well, this does have one of those ceramic filters, and that poor little thing's been going through a lot of heating and cooling cycles over its lifetime. So, yeah, and now actually that I have it unplugged, or it's actually safe to handle here. I'll actually get this flipped over so you can actually get a better view. of that little ceramic filter. And there it is. It's a little black box. So yeah, that's that's the little guy that's gotta go. So if you have an old tube type radio and I mean you would have had to have diagnosed it this far. You'd have needed a frequency counter to be able to check all your oscillator frequencies. But if everything looks okay and it's still just not uh, it's just the receipt and you turn your clarifier and yeah it's the signal seems to get louder and yeah it's when you actually get off frequency there's a good chance that uh, your crystal filter is bad because it's it's actually attenuating the signal where it shouldn't be and it's <laughs> so let me get that swapped out and see how it sounds yeah whatever that guy just said <laughs> so she's back up and running now uh, have tested all the tubes uh, as I thought it looked when I initially looked the radio over, all of the tubes are original to the radio. The date codes are all within like two months or so of each other, uh, it, with the exception of that one tube that looks like it's been, you know, cooking at the bottom of the ocean for the last few decades, uh, which has been replaced. Uh, replaced the electrolytic capacitors, took out a couple of the modifications, you know, just pipe just like nowadays, trust me, people have been screwdriver and radios since there have been radios. <laughs> so it's been unscrewdrivered, uh, which was just basically two pieces of wire. A couple uh, circuits that people had jumpered out. Uh, that's been put back to stock. Uh, now when I went to do, actually right before I went to do the alignment, I turned the radio on and put it on air, and it's it sounded... What? Yeah, off frequency is probably the best way because actually you turn the clarifier almost eh, I'd say like nine tenths eight to nine tenths of the way to the right and the signal was strongest uh, now these radios do not have any frequency adjustments when you do the alignment on them they tell you to check all of the frequencies for the synthesizer circuits you know all of your oscillator circuits but there are absolutely no frequency adjustments uh, but luckily the problem was not with the frequencies when I actually went and did the alignment check the frequencies they all the crystals were oscillating or all the oscillator circuits were within probably like 200 Hertz of being uh, correct which for radio, this vent actually even for modern radios, that's within within spec for pretty much every service manual there is when it comes to CB radios. But the problem was was the alignment um, of the actual receiver circuitry. So these radios do have a ceramic filter, uh, and it varies uh, the vintage of the radio, even just this model. These actually came in, I think, three different versions if I'm not mistaken um, I think the earlier one did not have the crystal filter this I think is the second version okay because there's actually a transformer here and I actually I think the third one's in the same is what they actually have in the Sam's manual let me just look here real quick take a look at the pictures yeah this is the the one that's in the Sam's manual was the last version you'll see that this trans has got tube here tube here and a relay right in front of the main power transformer there's a, a tunable transformer you'll see that's missing and there's actually a little circuit board the little box right there in the middle is actually the ceramic filter and then there's a small tunable transformer on either side of that so the, for the input and the output tuning 
of that crystal or ceramic filter. Excuse me, of that ceramic filter. These have them, they're just mounted on the underside of the radio in between this tube. Uh, yeah, it's from this tube to this transformer. It just goes from the output of the tube into the uh, the 455 kilohertz ceramic filter and then into this tunable transformer. So this, like I say, this one's kind of like a metal version. If I remember right, I think the the first version didn't even have the 455 filter. They just did it with the tuned circuit. Um, so these actually have a quieter receive than uh, a lot of your earlier tube radios because a lot of your AM tube radios, they had no actual filters in them. It was just all done with tuned circuits. So... But even after I got that aligned properly, which is done by injecting a, actually into this tube, you inject a uh, 455 kilohertz, is it this one? You want, yeah, that'd be, uh, yeah, it'd be that one. You inject a uh, 455 kilohertz audio signal and adjust for maximum. But that's, that's where if you inject a signal at the antenna jack, and you do it like the service manual says, you will end up with better results if you would align it like the radio, the service manual tells you to. Um, but even after doing all that, it still just did not sound right to me. It sounded off. Now, that had fixed the delta tune not being centered problem, because like I say, it was almost at full rotation. It was like eight to nine tenths of the way there. The clarifier or delta tune was now centered, but it still sounded off frequency, but it wasn't off, but it wasn't off frequency, because you could inject the signal, turn the clarifier, and you could see as you got off, turn the clarifier in either direction, the signal strength would drop. So that kind of led me to believe, eh, maybe the ceramic filter is bad, and it is. Uh, it's not uncommon for these to go bad. These go bad in uh, solid state radios. You know, you put one of these things inside of a tube radio, well, they're really going to go through some thermal cycling, and it's an old radio. It was made in 1977, um, according to the date code there on the chassis. Uh, so, yeah, I just popped a new one of these in. These things, these things are cheap, you know, dime a dozen type things. <laughs> so, drop the new 455 ceramic filter in it. Now the audio sounds good. So, now it's done. Uh, all I got to do is clean the covers on it and put it back together. So, just really quick show you what she looks like before I slap the covers back on it. Oh, and here's a question for the radio community. Anybody that's watched this far. This microphone plug. <laughs> if anybody knows, I have searched and not had any luck. I'm looking for microphone plugs currently manufactured. Now, I've got old stock, um, and occasionally you can buy some good old ones. But what I'm looking for is, are there any manufacturers, uh, not just, I don't need more than one. All I'm looking for is one manufacturer left on the face of this planet that's still in business that makes good premium quality microphone plugs. What I mean by premium quality microphone plugs is, are ones that have machined pins. Okay, your standard microphone plugs that everybody's used to seeing nowadays. Now, this is actually a vintage one. This is an older Midland style, but still, they have this style pin. You can see it's basically just a piece of stamped out sheet metal. So, it's a piece of, you know, tin-plated copper, but it's just stamped out of a piece of sheet metal. The pins in this type of plug are not like that. These started out life as a solid piece of brass, and then they were plated. Um, but they're very heavy. And I can't find anybody that makes these anymore. If anybody knows of a company somewhere <laughs> that still manufactures ultra-high quality microphone plugs with machined pins, let me know. And I'm sure lots of other people would appreciate it, <laughs> too, because I've had people ask me. You know, I run into having to replace plugs all the time, like on my bench mics. These things are getting can get plugged in and unplugged 20, 30, 40 times a day, if not more. You know, depending on working on a radio, how many times I gotta you know flip the radio over, I unplug the cord, plug it back in. So yeah, they they only let now these the 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 vintage Midland styles, even though they're the stamped out steel one or stamped out style, um, they still seem to hold hold up really good. But these things pretty much last forever. They just never wear out because they're you can see how much metal there is to the pins how thick the it is around there that's because that started out life as a solid chunk of brass but yeah if anybody's got any clue if there's still a company that makes good high quality mic plugs let me know 
Um, so anyhow, radio, get the power supply turned off over there. Uh, only thing tube wise it was replaced was the 16 ba6 that was replaced with a jam military tube so yeah just and basically if you're not familiar with vacuum tubes military tubes can be used to replace normal civilian tubes the big difference with military tubes is they're just a heavier construction so the tube that i stuck in here was this one okay it's a jan 5749w it has a heavy-duty filament. They're basically meant to take military abuse. A lot of vibration, impact resistance. So you, usually the plates, uh, especially like the mica uh, washers at the top and the bottom, the plates that actually hold the you know, all of the metal parts in here, the, the mica insulators at the top and the bottom, they'll usually be thicker. The filaments are made of a little bit heavier uh, winding, so they don't break as easily. But uh, yeah, so that was replaced. All the electrolytic capacitors. Um, I will tie up these wires before I put the cover back on. But uh, you know, a couple electrolytic caps on the top here, and then on the bottom side here, we've changed out all of the paper filter capacitors. Only three of those in these, and then you can see all the electrolytic capacitors down here. Now there are a few hiding in here. Uh, they're easy to miss. <laughs> like there's one little guy that hides out right here. Um, a lot of people often miss this one. It's kind of, I mean, it's kind of obvious to see, but yeah, I've, I've actually seen a lot of radios where somebody recapped a radio and they missed that one and they missed that one. That, just because they're, depending how the components are arranged in here, it might be kind of, you know, subdued. <laughs> it's been covered over with other parts. Uh, pulled the low voltage power supply board out, all fresh caps on that too. Um, yeah, other than that, I did replace this one resistor here. Uh, this is the one that had an arc, and I think that probably came when this capacitor shorted out, which I also replaced. This ceramic capacitor had been replaced before, and what, what this ceramic capacitor is on, it's on the output of the windings from the main power transformer, the high voltage output. So it's like 100 and some volts uh, AC when it comes out, and then it goes into the, uh, you know, to be rectified, and of course DC voltage is in higher. But that cap is across that, so yeah, anytime the radio is on that has high volt, you know, high AC voltage across it. So just like line filter caps, those things can commonly fail. I think that's probably where that burn mark came on the original resistor. So I just went ahead and replaced the resistor anyhow because it had a burn spot on it. Just don't don't want to take any chances. And uh, I did replace the ceramic capacitor that someone else had put in here. I put in uh, the one that was in here was a 500 volt, and it looked. Yeah, kind of like a cheaper modern day one. I put in a good high quality one. This one's a rated for a thousand volts, so that thing should yeah pretty much last <laughs> the life of the owner now. Other than that, remove the bodge jumper wire here and the bodge jumper wire across this resistor, which were the two modifications that were in here. Um, the other resistor here that that was fine. Um, I think somebody just replaced that. That one may have been burned up, or you know, actually now that I think about it, that's the receive voltage. I wonder if, because remember this radio came in with almost, it's almost deaf, <laughs> no receive. I wonder if somebody replaced that in an attempt to fix the low receive sensitivity. That's possible. So that may be what, why that was replaced. And of course it didn't fix it. Um, oh, and there's the ceramic filter that was replaced. I can actually show you that down here. So there's a little box there. It's just soldered from this capacitor, which goes to this tube that blocks the DC so that couples your AC signal in that pin goes down to the ground tab right down here and then the output is soldered directly to the center pin on this tunable transformer so like I say replace that little guy it didn't change the frequency but what happens with those ceramic filters is the pass band so you've got you know basically you can think of it as a, a hump you're looking at your frequency spectrum you've got your hump your RF energy you want to filter out, but if you know, you've got this much coming through, you only want your bandwidth to be this wide. Well, if the frequency of that filter changes, the pass band changes, either up or down. And you'll start to lose audio fidelity because it's actually starting to cut out some of the audio. It hasn't changed the RF frequency. It's just changed what por portion of that frequency spectrum that it's filtering out. So yeah, when they go bad, that can they can also affect your your receive sensitivity. And like I say, it was just 
I just heard it and it was just like, ah, oh, man, it just doesn't quite sound right, you know. By alignment specs, the radio was fine, but yeah, it's just one of those things, you, you can hear it when they, they start to shift frequency too far, and usually if you can, it gets to the point where you can hear it, honestly, it's pretty bad. Um, if I had to guess, I'd say this original one had probably shifted a thousand hertz, if not more, um, would be my guess. You know, I could stick it on a spectrum analyzer and feed you know, with a tracking generator into it just to see. But yeah, if I had to guess, I'd say this filter probably shifted by close to a thousand hertz. So, so let me get the covers put back. Actually, I just leave it upside down. Put the bottom one first, and uh, I'll let you see what it looks like all back together. Okay, so she's back together now. A uh, cabinet's in pretty good condition. I mean, if you if you've ever seen some of these radios. Uh, the 23 channel or the 40 channel, a lot of times the, the radios are in horrible condition. They've been stored in a garage or in a damp basement, and they'll be rusty and horrible. You know, it's got some battle scars. It's got a few nicks in the paint. Um, I'd have to say the radio was dropped at some point in time because the back of the chassis where it's bent a little bit, and then there is some a little bit of crinkling in the, the cover here. I'm not going to try to straighten that out. <laughs> Just speaking from experience, when you have painted covers... If a radio gets dropped, the co and it's not like this chassis is horribly bent, but there is a little bit of yeah, a little bit of bending going on here. The problem is, is if you try to straighten that out, you stand a really good chance of the paint flaking off. It got flexed one time, and usually it's fine. If you leave that little crinkle in it right there, it'll be okay. The problem is when you try to straighten the metal back out. It's just like with working with sheet metal and auto body work. The more you move metal, it expands, you know, or contracts, like if you were using a shrinking hammer. But you can, you know, the metal can expand and contract. The problem is when you try to straighten out that dent, a lot of times the paint will flake off. Well, what's going to look worse? A gigantic bare spot with touch-up paint on it or a little bit of a bend? So, yeah, this is one of those cases where I just leave that little bit of, that little dent right there. I just leave it alone. It'll look a lot better. Honestly, when you look at the face of the radio, it's not like you're ever going to see that back corner anyhow, so <laughs> we'll just leave it as is. Um, so, good work at radio, and I'll just, uh, yeah, apparently a lot of people like to listen to, listening to the radio. So, I'll just scan through the channels. Uh, the skip is definitely coming in today. It's been dead here for several days, and yeah, it just seemed like the... The floodgates opened above my head today, or this evening, because, man, the skip is really rolling in. So I'll just run through the channels, um, and I'll play around with the, the tone control here. This has, remember, that pull switch right here for a tone control. And all that does is, is adds a capacitor into the, uh, the output of the AM detector diode circuit, where it goes into the first uh, audio amplifier. They... When you pull this control out, it adds a 0 .0033 cap to that circuit. And all that does is, is then shunts any of the high audio frequencies to ground. So you'll notice when I pull that out, the high pitch, the high tones are going to disappear. I prefer listening to a radio like that, which you know is limited bandwidth. I prefer listening to it like that because it gets rid of all of the high... Because most of your static, the noise, you know, the hash and the trash, the sizzling bacon, that's all high-pitched. So when you enable that tune control, most of that disappears. So... And you can hear, to, that sounds a little sharp. And you know what it is. Uh, so can I put the word out there for the rest of this week? But then actually, come Friday, it's gone. To me, it just... Yes, it's the audio is a little bit pinched there, but it actually sounds clear. Like that guy there, as he started to fade out, I could he I could make out more of what he was saying when I had that tone control on than when I had the tone control off. That's because that cap being in circuits, cutting out the high frequencies, which when he started to fade out, the static started to come in. So it cuts out that static, and I could still hear the mids and the lows in his voice, where when this, the filter was off, his voice was really being overridden by the high-pitched static. So like I say, I personally like that, That's but that's a user thing. Some people like it. 
and use it. Other people don't. So you know that's if you like it, use it. If not, don't. <laughs> Everybody talking at once. If this was a sideband radio, I can hear some sideband going on there. But you can hear the difference it makes in the background hiss. And yes, the modulation light is attached to the audio amplifier in this, and of course that's used for both you know, receive audio coming out of your speaker and modulation to the, the final tube, so your final modulation. So the modulation light works on both receive and transmit, but the modulation light only comes on and receive the higher you turn the volume because the tube's putting out more and eventually gets to a point where it will start to illuminate that neon bulb. If we can get somebody to talk now again. I just noticed something. I got to take the top cover back off. The receive lights out. Crap! I know the transmit works because I saw it come on. And there's the PA. There's the external. <laughs> the damn receive lights out. Son of a bugaboo! How did I not notice that till now? <laughs> oh well. Maybe I'm not done. <laughs> I'll do that off camera. But, Nah, I heard it, 
Well, you just keep on getting down. So <laughs> I think that ought to do it for this. And yes, it does take, as you notice, the display slowly going to go out because that's the capacitors and the that circuit are discharging. So when you turn it off, it takes it a little while for that display to finally go out completely. It's not like you turn it off like most radios and whoop, it's just the display goes off. It actually has to discharge the capacitors in the in the circuit there that's driving the, the seven segment displays. So let me get that light changed. But yep, there you go. There's a restored Robin T240D base mobile radio. Uh, a hybrid solid state and tube type. Okay. Light's been replaced. <laughs> Just so you can see it does work. Now it's done.